Thanks again for coming over to the Stephanie store uh, yesterday. Uh, we love seeing you all. He'd seen camping 
and he translated it into his culture. And, and he was able to do it in a way where he boasts that you know, Snow Peak um, has, has become a part of like modern day Japanese outdoor culture. It's really influenced it. So, so, so where he's at is, or let's, let's just look at something really important. This is, um, this is a classic US campground, right? So you have a few different key elements. We have a picnic table built in. Maybe, I don't know, most of them probably built a long time ago, and maybe the New Deal or something, I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> you, you have uh, a fire pit. So most of them have a grill on it. Sometimes there's even an extra grill, which is extra cool. Um, and you need some sort of flat spot for a tent. And, and there's your campground. <coughs> in Japan, this is their campground. So, so here you are, you know, you're Coleman, for example, and you're going, wow, let's start distributing products to Japan. This is great, it's an emerging market. And so you sell, you know, uh, tents, and you sell two burner stoves, and no one's buying two burner stoves. No one's going camping. What's wrong? Well, there's no table to put it on. There's no, there's no fire pit. Like, that's not fun. So, um, so, so that was that was what Mr. Shima did. He took his dad's brand that he had started, which was just a, a selection of outdoor gear, and and he did two things that I think is pretty interesting. He uh, first he made a simple solution. And there it is. There's Snow Peak. There's the start. <laughs> it's pretty pretty simple, but there was something to put your two burner stove on. And people ate it up, sold it like crazy. And, and literally, this thing becomes the funding piece for Snow Peak. Uh, people are now camping. I'm sure my slides will keep doing this. Um, so this, the second thing he did, which Michelle brought up really well, was he created a culture, a culture around design. And I, I think what's really important is, you know, your mission, your company's mission, and getting everyone to buy into it. You know, do we know our mission? Can we state it? Does everyone in our company or our group know it? And best of all, does the end consumer know it by just touching our product? So here's the Snoopy one, and it's been translated, so it's not exact. Um, but there's three elements. There's like a tradition, <coughs> craft, and legacy element. So I'll just read it. We, we place our trust in the vision of our employees and come together as a team unified by a common goal to be the world's leading manufacturer of exceptional outdoor lifestyle products. And the second element is this kind of inspired innovation. We embrace our customer's vision and point of view as our own and deliver products and services that inspire us both. We are constantly innovating and building new trends. Our ideas are always in the move. And stewardship. We strive to create a positive impact through everything we do. Now here's the deal. This isn't just a mission statement that is on a plaque somewhere. This is stated every single time there's a meeting. We stand up and we recite this. I mean, it's, it sounds sometimes odd, especially when it's in a different language. Like, I'll do, a, I'll do a conference call, and then, you know, every single meeting, I'll do a conference call. I'm sitting there, and then there's people in the office, and I'm listening, and then all of a sudden there's like this chanting going on, and they're like looking at my computer, what are you guys doing? Um, but, but, but why this is, I think, really unique and amazing is every decision we make is filtered through our mission. Everything. And so many times I'm like, guys, this is a really good opportunity, or let's lower our price, or let's do this, or let, you know, I, so many times the pressure of sales and, and me wanting to be successful has been stopped because it didn't clear the mission statement. So it's been, yeah, it's, it's cool. <laughs> um, so this is it. This is the Japanese campsite. Um, you know, you have a portable fire pit. I don't know if you can see it. It's right down there. You have a portable table and grill set. You have folding furniture that's compact because, you know, there's not huge trucks driving around. And you have a very luxurious tent. Um, and so, you know, this is it though. There, that's it. There's nothing else. This is it. There's no, there's no lake. There's no canoe. There's no quads. 
There's no hunting or fishing or any of that. This is it. So, so what's happened is, for us, camping is a means to an end. For, for, and that's how we value it. You know, a lot, I've seen people buy tents, put a big blue tarp over it, and then it's in the trash as they leave. Literally. I mean, so, so that's our evaluation system, I think, overall, of camping, means to an end. We're really doing it so we can go kayaking or hiking or bouldering, or whatever it is. But in Japan, it's all about just leaving your busy life and just being with your friend, family and friends. And so this is all they do. They, they sit and they, they eat and they have conversation. They cook. Snowbeam's also done a really good job of taking Japanese culture and going to the next level. So this is basically a tatami floor outside. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but um, you're sitting down, you're grilling in the middle of your tent, and everyone's hanging out having a really good time, and a whole lot of sake, <laughs> and beer, and all that. So, from the time the stream I had that very first product to about 15 years later, 30 million people were claimed they camp. And it wasn't just Snowpeak, there was now all of a sudden 20 Japanese brands. So there's this camping boom, and it's this legendary thing that I hear about over and over again with all these different presentations that the president does. I tried to get this cool graph he has of like our sales over history, because um, as the boom hit, like many booms, there was a bust. And Snowpeak came from this huge brand um, and just started plummeting. Along with a lot, you know, the economy struggled in the 90s. So this is around that time when uh, people are tightening their belts and leisure time became less of a priority. <clears throat> Not to mention 20 other brands copying your products. And so it, it just, it was, it was a tough time. And so what that pushed them to do is look outside of Japan. So now we're in the next spot of retranslating. So here you have this, this designer, and that's really what he is. He's our head designer. Um, interpreting camping through his lens. Um, now we have an idea of how do you how do you reinterpret that? How do you retranslate that back west? And so translating for um, that's been my job, and it's not easy. Um, you know, Japanese invention is sometimes hard to translate, <laughs> but it's still innovative. <laughs> this one's shocking. I apologize. <laughs> uh, a lap pillow. It's very innovative. Oh. Um, also, very efficient. You know, double double tapping things. So, you know, in, in all seriousness, it's, it, it isn't easy to translate culture. It just, you just don't get it. I don't get it sometimes. And they don't get it sometimes. And we just have to be honest about that. Um, but. They, in 1996, they started a plan, and they hired some really smart people in, in the U.S., or one really smart guy, that helped uh, kind of navigate culture, and he was Japanese, and, and, and so he was collaborating with the designers in Japan, and we designed, um, we didn't launch it until 1999, but in 96, we started developing this concept of lightweight backpacking and stuff. We thought the, the, the current products wouldn't fit, there is no high-end camping that exists in the U.S. And so let's start here. Let's start where the consumer does value something high-end. So we came out, that's, that's a cool ad we came out with. This is the, what's in that egg, is the stove. Um, ended up winning an award, ended up putting the stove on the map. And what's cool about this product is, to this day, uh, we're still winning awards. In fact, I'm selling more today than I ever have in any other year. It's still, still a top selling product. Um, so that's what's neat about gear versus apparel. You can sell it for a long time. <laughs> uh, next was titanium. You know, um, we were one of the, I, I can't say we were the first, I don't know, but we were definitely one of the first that was using titanium for uh, like cookware and cups and, and things like that. And so we were an early adopter at the very least. And it was great timing, you know. All of a sudden, I don't know if you guys remember the book Lightweight Craze where, you know, it, it became ridiculous. But, but yeah, we were at great timing. The same time we're launching this, all of a sudden, that next season, everyone's wanting to talk about Lightweight. 
So, um, well, maybe I'll go back just for a second. So, so that was a success. Then they hired me, <laughs> full time. And in 2006, the goal was, okay, we did it. This is first step, now step two in our master plan. Let's do it all. So the whole entire catalog came to the US. Uh, we, we ended up having a 50 by 50 booth at the OR show. We spent a ridiculous amount of money. It's my first you know, month on the job, basically. And from you know, college, I had been interning and staying connected. But I'm, I'm, I'm back, on, I'm on board I'm full time. They're investing in staff. And now my job is to launch the full brand. And it, it didn't work. Um, it, it, it was cool. Everyone loved it. We had this amazing booth and, and I had, you know, I had gone to all the key retailers and prepped it and everyone was into it, but in the end it just didn't fit. It just wasn't a product designed through the lens of our culture. It was through someone else's. And, um, and, and some things did, you know, and then we kept redirecting. So, so then Design the Reach calls me up and now they're carrying a bunch of our stuff. So oh, maybe the answer is it's furniture. Maybe that's it. Maybe we'll take all of our cool furniture and maybe it's like outdoor patio stuff. And, and again, you know, we tried and, and there was a limited success, but it wasn't what we wanted. It wasn't part of our goal of, of inspiring people to go outdoors with gear. So um, there was a few things I learned along the way. Nimawashi is a, is a, is a term that I don't use, but it's, it's a good example of what I've learned on, on how to interact with Snowpeak. And it's consensus building. So you, so you don't just go and present and it's gonna, it's gonna happen. You don't, you don't just go with a beautiful presentation and slam on the table and say, we gotta do this and, and, they're gonna, and it's gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. And so learning that was really important and learning how to navigate the culture and being someone that listens being someone that's humble to, to, to make sure you're doing it their way. Um, so for example, so you know, I started hanging out with the designers, taking them, inviting them to the US, going and eating at their house, and coming and having dinner at my house when they're in Portland, and, and really doing, trying to convince all the players before I made the and then make the presentation. Um, so we started having success, finally, I, I, and I was building a good team, and, and so, from 2006, when I started, to 2008, just stagnation, nothing. In fact, I think sales went down. Um, so it wasn't a good start, but, but, but perseverance, um, like I said, building a good team, taking big risks, um, making sure that what I did actually matched the mission. It took a while for me to learn that, to be honest. Um, I kept just wanting to repeat what I see other brands doing, and they would, you know, not, not literally, but they'd slap me around like, no, don't just copy what other people do. Just do it our way, you know, and so after finally, literally it took years for me to learn these things, Snowy USA started to grow. And we started getting products designed from R&D people that made sense here, and things started happening. But, we're not there yet. So here's my last little presentation on my argument about the current trend and kind of our take on it and how we think um, not only looking through the lens of this culture, um, but making sure it's good timing um, and, and making sure it's within our mission statement. And I think all those things are finally coming together for some people. So, Outdoors the New Heritage, that's, that's kind of my statement. Um, and it's more on just talking about culture and trend. And, and really this is less about um, Snowpeak, but more about what's happening, what I see happening right now, and what I think is just great timing for our brand. So, Heritage, um, I, I think it refers to a five year trend in its wear that was uh, mainly focused on, you know, traditional materials and the way things are produced. I am going to argue in front of you guys that heritage is receding and being replaced by progressive outdoor as a place of dominance in niche men's fashion. Um, and as we'll see in the next slide, similarities make it 
between the two, I think, are making it an easy acquisition for a niche brand. <coughs> so, Heritage versus Progressive Outdoor. Um, so, some of the similarities. You know, Heritage values the product and the brand. The focus was and is on production and, um, and function. And values longevity of the garment and aging for both the brand and the consumer. But Progressive Outdoor, on the other hand, well, actually, there's a lot of similarities. It values the history of the product and brand, just like Heritage does. But the focus is a little different in that uh, there's a focus on style and function. And values longevity of the garment and aging. So, you know, I think a good example, just so this isn't too, like, wordy, would go to Topo. Um, you know, I think they could do a lot of storytelling around um, how it's made and, you know, the because it is made in America, but what, what I'm seeing them talk about is the side, and I think that it's working. In fact, you guys, you guys um, we're constantly looking at your dealer list. Uh, so you guys, it's working, you know? Um, you, they're, they're in a lot of great shops, and so I think that's a good example of progressive outdoor, um, and, and this kind of shift and pivot. So progressive outdoor, I want to find, and, and this is now comparing against traditional outdoor. Um, <coughs> mostly refers to, well, products that focus more on aesthetics and appeal to an urban consumer, uh, rather than traditional outdoor brands that focus more on um, like specs. So, for example, um, outdoor, you know, it values specs and, and materials, and it's not a bad thing. You know, uh, it's actually incredible. The what our industry has done. Um, but I think, you know, in general, when you focus on something, you know, you can't focus on everything at the same time. So aesthetics tend to, tend to wane when the very focus is, is specs and, and function. And it, as a result, I'd argue, it doesn't necessarily, um, I think fashion, it just doesn't speak to them so well. But our progressive outdoor, again, is a focus on style and materials. And, and values aesthetics equal to function. Um, and appeals, and as a result, appeals to a fashion consumer. So I, I just quickly grabbed a, a hoodie. I, I didn't have a lot of time. I just searched the kind of hoodie from a traditional outdoor brand. And you know, it's what, we, what we've all done. You know, it's, it's trademark names with, with um, like whatever, funk, like with the technology and um, and I'm guilty too of, you know, like, wow, um, I got this award, I'm going to splash it up there. And that's fine, it's not a bad thing, but, you know, just the contrast of a brand that's what I would call a progressive outdoor brand. And they're me. Um, and, you know, both are going to work. It's just, you know, they're speaking to different, from the very core of the brand, they're speaking to a different consumer. So Japanese brands are leaders in progressive outdoors is another claim I'm going to make. And I, and I don't think it's that crazy to make. I think when you look at, um, like, for example, Tokyo has 10% of the entire population of Japan lives in one city. And so, so you're obviously a much more urban society. And when there's an outdoor sector, outdoor consumer, I think just it makes sense that there's a higher percentage of urban people doing you know, outdoor activities. And I don't know if you guys walked a few blocks over there, or if you guys have been to downtown LA, or, you know, I think we all know how, how things are urbanizing. So I think it's, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to look at a culture that's already been there to figure out how we proceed with our trend that's, that's, that's happening right now. But, you know, Japan's been doing it for a while. I think we all know that. <laughs> um, so, right there on the, uh, your guys' left, um, is Lisa. And it's a pretty amazing story. So she's the head designer. And she is actually the third generation Iman. She's the daughter of the president. And it just so happens she's a brilliant designer. Um, it didn't have to be that way. She probably still would have you know, been allowed to try this project out. But, um, I don't know, maybe not, but she is, she's brilliant. 
And, um, and she also isn't a designer that has to be taught our, our ethos, our mission. She lived her whole life. She grew up camping with her dad. She, she really gets it. And so what's happened is her experience in high fashion in Tokyo and then moving back to her, her dad's company, um, what, what she's been able to produce is really amazing. It's actually Snow Peak's brand just in a barrel format. And, um, and I feel really lucky that, that we have that product. And also what, what I'm trying to do is take the lessons learned from the past and really be involved with the design and with Lisa and with the whole team over there. Um, so that way, as we approach it here, it's through the lens of our culture. It's not just us forcing it. Um, so, I'll just end with one thing. Let's see if I can grab it. Sorry, I was, I was making a few. Um, we translated, we translated uh, one of, she, she, she typed a bunch of stuff. And we didn't want you to know like, what this document said, so we translated it. Um, so this is her words, Lisa's. Clothing that keeps in touch with life and nature. The Japanese term shin, is fitting to this concept of clothing having a purpose. Shin is written in two parts, plant and heart. It can be interpreted as the heart that resides in plants as well as within ourselves. Snow Peak tents that shin. Snow Peak's tents changed the image of camping, which before was surviving um, in nature with minimal equipment to being surrounded by nature and comfort. I want Snow Peak's clothing to be the same. Clothing that reminds us of the com comforts of nature, the functionality of the clothes must be absolute. Making outdoor clothes that can bear the elements without the uh, heart to be liberated. Excuse me, allows the heart to be liberated. I want to make clothes like that. So, um, so she is an inspiration. She has this passion around what she wants to do. It's, it is matching our mission statement. So it's it's gotten through that track mark. Um, and right now it's just a really exciting time because we do have um, really great retailers support and really great partners and, um, and, a, and a really great team working really hard. And, and, I, and I believe in this. I believe that this can be the future for, for our brand. And, and, and I don't know, you know maybe it's the future of, of how outdoor clothing evolves.